Hi, Justin. How are you doing? Hi, Roberto. I'm good. Good to see you again. What about yourself? Yes. Well, for the people that don't know you and they don't, don't know me, we met each other in Miami. You work in this firm that works with companies and, uh, well, people that want to invest in Barbados and they want to have real knowledge of how the structure of com companies and stuff, you work on that. Tell us a little bit about it. Sure, yes. Yeah. So I work for a company called DGM Financial Group. And we're a bit of a kind of one-stop shop in terms of the services that we provide um, in Barbados. We can incorporate companies, we can set up trusts and act as trustees. And we also provide management services for those companies. So if they're set up here, we can do accounting services, um, we can assist with bank accounts and, and various other things um, that need to be done in Barbados. And if there's a service that we don't provide, we then, of course, have local networks where we can put the, the client or individual in touch with somebody to ensure that they receive the advice that they need. Tell us a little bit about the tax regime in, in Barbados, because people that is interested, well, the world, every day is smaller and smaller. So you can have presence worldwide and opening a company in Barbados could be really interesting considering the tax treaties they have, considering the, 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 the tax uh, rates they charge, depending on the, of the company. Tell us a little bit the tax regime in Barbados. Right, so Barbados has, um a wide network of double taxation agreements as well as bilateral investment treaties. And it's always been, so I think we have, um, I can't remember the exact number, but maybe around 35 double taxation agreements and probably about 10 bilateral investment treaties. Um, it's always been a jurisdiction based on um, transparency, the rule of law, um, and those types of things. In addition, we are a low tax jurisdiction. So we do have corporation taxes, they range from five and a half percent and all the way down to one percent on a sliding scale. So actually the larger the income, the lower the tax rate becomes. I would say on average for most companies, they tend to fall in the three percent bracket. Uh, so, you know, Barrios has really marketed itself as an international hub. You know, businesses looking to do, to expand globally um, the point really is for them to set up a base in Barbados to then reach out to the world um, as the approach that we take. In addition, um, we have no capital gains tax and we have no inheritance tax. Yes, I could read, I could read that Barbados has three treaties uh, with countries like Spain, Mexico, Panama, United States, uh, United Kingdom. And it's important to have it in mind because a lot of people could think that this special jurisdiction and considering tax could be really risky. But on the contrary, we'll see that Barbados has been really transparent and rule of law, you mentioned it, and politically very stable. So there are good things about investing in Barbados. Yeah, so let me touch on a, on a couple of them. I mean, Barbados actually has the third oldest parliament in the Western Hemisphere, which is which dates back to 1639. And we've had a stable government for our entire existence. Um, I mean, originally a colony of um, England, uh, we were independent from 1966, and then we're probably gonna be a republic either later this year or next year. Um, so there's that. And then in terms of the treaties that you mentioned, I mean, I'm, I'll speak uh, to the to the ones um, I suppose to do in Latin America and Spain, since that's probably most relevant to, to your audience. Uh, but we do have, a, and you being in Venezuela, we have a double taxation agreement with Venezuela, as well as a bilateral investment treaty. And we're one of the very we're one of very few countries that actually have this bilateral investment uh, treaty with Venezuela, and that's very useful given the situation in Venezuela in that the bilateral investment treaty basically adds additional protections uh, for foreign direct investment made into Venezuela by international investors. Um, it provides protection from expropriation and includes fair treatment clauses. So this ensures that compensation is offered by Venezuela in the event of a loss of property. 
And it also provides for the use of international arbitration to settle unresolved disputes between the affected parties through the World Bank's International Center for Settlement of Investment Disputes. Interesting, In interesting, really interesting. One thing I wanted to ask you, and also you mentioned it, the, the, there is no tax on inheritance because it is hard to say, but a lot of people do to this situation of, of COVID They're thinking really seriously in assuming the protection of, of uh, wealth and also, uh, well, what, what could happen if one of us dies? So preparing your, your, your assets, preparing what could happen if one of us dies. And tell us a little bit about that. There is no tax planning. Uh, there is no tax on inheritance. But how could it work? You should open an, an, an account or you should uh, have a, an escrow or what more or less people do on those situations? So, um, I mean, I suppose what we see a lot of in terms of any sort of planning tends to be individuals settling trusts. Now I understand in Latin America, you, you all are more familiar with foundations and that is the type of structure that you use. Unfortunately, Barbados, did have a Foundations Act. It was not really fit for purpose and it has been repealed. We are supposed to be um, passing a new one in the near future. But for the time being, we use trust, which is really the English common law system, uh, which is a bit different from foundations. And what tends to happen is an individual for inheritance purposes will settle the trust and they will then list the beneficiaries and basically their intentions of the trust, how the trust will operate and distribute assets in the future. So that would probably be one of the main um, types of planning that people use for inheritance. All of that being said, any individual from another country that is looking to use Barbados, whether it's for inheritance planning, sign up an international company, anything at all, they also need to seek local advice You know, if you're a Venezuelan and someone needs to come and speak to you about what is allowed in Venezuela, just because you set up something in Barbados doesn't necessarily mean the Venezuelan government isn't going to still say, hey, you're still a citizen here and, and you've died and you still need to pay, um, you know, inheritance tax still needs to be paid. And this doesn't apply just to Venezuela, you know, this is um, the UK, Canada, the US, um, you know, sure, there's implementation in Barbados. But individuals need to know that, you know, you need to seek appropriate planning in your home country. Um, it's not just as simple as setting something up and, you know, using a different country's laws. Yes, it can be done, but um, appropriate planning is necessary at all levels, I think. It is. And it is important to have in mind that having a company in another country, it doesn't mean that it's, you just you know, are excluded of other responsibilities and li liabilities. That's, That's correct. why it's important to have, you know, professionals in law and accountancy and depending on your company and depending on the, the plans you have. You also mentioned it, uh, insurance. Tell us a little bit the, the insurance. Do you have uh, certain jurisdictions in, that complies with in international insurance, boats, ships, and registration and that? Right. So in terms of insurance, and that's actually a good question because what Barbados does have in that market is um, what we call captive insurance companies. A captive insurance company is really if you have a large group or association or company where you want to set up your own insurance company to, um, you know, there, there are numerous reasons for doing so. Um, it may give you a better um, option than what's available on the market. You may be large enough to support your insurance company. And it's also, and sometimes people can't get certain types of insurance in the market or they're very expensive. And actually that's something that's going on right now worldwide is the market is very hard. And when they say hard, that means that any insurance, you know, when you get a quote, prices are going up, they're not negotiable. Some people won't even offer insurance for certain types of risks, such as um, directors and officers insurance. That's become very difficult to get. So it's kind of a, a captive is an alternative uh, risk management tool. And Barbados has a very attractive um, captive insurance regime. And 
Latin America generally has now been getting into the use of captives. It's a, it's a more mature market in say Canada, the United States, and Europe, but it's not as mature in Latin America. So we expect to see a lot of growth there in the future. And we have seen, Barbados has seen a lot of them coming out of Mexico uh, in particular. And once again, we come back to the treaties. Barbados has a double taxation agreement with Mexico. And although we're a low tax jurisdiction, because of that agreement, we are not on Mexico's, you know, they have a tax haven blacklist where I believe they target certain low tax jurisdictions. But the use of this treaty and ensuring that we, you know, have an open, transparent relationship with them has allowed us to get off of that list. And now uh, we get quite a lot of business coming there from people setting up these insurance companies. And, you know, this is very much a risk management tool. Yes, we talk about tax, we talk about those things, but they're not coming here to avoid tax. They're coming here to use a particular structure that is fit for purpose and achieves what they want in terms of managing insurance. In addition, sorry, let me just, I'll just add, just because we have the agreement with Spain, what you find is um, Spanish investors, obviously the old links between Latin America and Spain, Spanish investors looking to set up insurance companies in Latin America will also go through Barbados. So it's a nice connection where everything has double taxation agreements to guide it along the way. You're mentioning <coughs> two things really important. You're mentioning a blacklist and you're mentioning tax haven. And it's important to understand that being a very respectful jurisdiction and very transparent, it couldn't be considered a tax haven. One thing is that you have a special regime and meanwhile you have international companies. It is a good thing to, you know, to see the, 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 the operation worldwide and it's a good opportunity to base certain part of the operation in Barbados. Yes, correct. And Barbados has been committed to working with all the various international organizations. We had signed on to the OECD and their efforts for international tax, and we have been working with them and complying with them. Well, it is important to remark that the compliance is full. I mean, it doesn't mean that yes. you have a very special taxation regime. Again, Again. it doesn't mean that you are, you know, uh, avoiding the liabilities that you have in, in certain jurisdictions. Correct. And um, exactly. I mean, Barbados, as I said, everything is transparent and there is no, you know, there's no secret bank accounts. There are lots of questions from the bank. And as we say, you know, this is what I was talking about structure. And once again, when people come to us, we want to make sure they've gotten good advice in the country that they're coming from. What we're doing is setting up a structure that is going to fit within the law, um, be fully allowed, and is going to work for that person in the foreign country that they're doing everything above board so that nothing goes wrong. There are no consequences, in, you know, of somebody trying to, to find a loophole. It's not, it's not anything like that. This is all uh, structured planning and professional advice. And that's how Barbados uh, chooses to operate. Great, great. Now we're talking about banking. And banking is really important because we have to, you know, have trust banks where you can have your money there. But there is also a phenomenon called fintech. What yes. is the approach of Barbados jurisdictions and laws and regime towards banking and fintech and all this phenomenon that we're be dealing to, with? Right, so I'll handle that in, um, I suppose, two different ways. I mean, Barbados has a number of banks here. Um, three, three of the large Canadian banks and two regional banks tend to be the main players. However, you can have a Barbados company and get bank accounts outside of Barbados. So just because you're setting up oh, a Barbados company, that doesn't necessarily mean that you are just using the banking available in Barbados. Once again, we're looking at an international focus. So you can use a Barbados company to get bank accounts in the United States. And I, I say this because, as you would know, with um, various fintech projects, cryptocurrencies, some banks, you know, hear Bitcoin and they run for the hills. They're absolutely not interested. And the, the local banks or the banks operating in Barbados are very conservative. And to be honest, they're not interested in banking projects that are handling cryptocurrencies. 
However, you can still use a Barbados company and use international banks that are more crypto friendly as the way for everything to work together. So yes, we have reputable banks um, that companies sub here can use. However, if they're in FinTech and cryptocurrencies, it's probably advisable for them to use an international bank. That being said, I can talk also now, so that's the banking aspect, but I can talk about the government's approach and what they're doing in terms of regula regula regulation and um, FinTech in this space. So we have a couple of things. Um, Barbados has a regulatory sandbox approach that is overseen jointly by both the Central Bank of Barbados as well as the Financial Services Commission. And the point of this is to use it for innovative technology uh, where regulation doesn't currently exist or current regulation may not be suitable. Um, and really the, the broad idea is to work with the regulators as a partnership with the intention to also ensure that consumers are protected. Um, so basically, I suppose the, the main points are that it's, you know, companies that will go into this sandbox represent a genuine financial innovation. They may be using technologies that are unproven and the failure could provide, could give rise to risks to the consumer or financial instability. And also the type of technology may create ambiguity in the current regulatory regime. So for example, we have a, we have a company here called Bit which is um, Overstock, which is a well-known public company had invested in BIT and they have developed a digital dollar. So a digital Barbados dollar which, where I have an app on my phone and I can go and use it in the gas station, the supermarket, scan a QR code and pay. It's, it's what we would call a stable coin for the Barbados dollar. They're an example of a company that went into the sandbox and what the regulators were looking for they wanted to ensure that these guys were doing KYC on the people that they were onboarding, uh, one, and they wanted to also then make sure they had the collateral for each digital dollar that they issued. Um, so they would have to have 100% of the, the cash that they have issued um, digitally backed up in an account. So that would be an example of that. Great, great. And this phenomenon of fintech and cryptocurrencies are really suitable with this idea of sandbox because it's really new and it's a good way that you know all the all the gamers are there the users the developers the authorities and they they can check the the, the behavior of the of the, of the phenomenon it is really important exactly i mean as you know the space is very dynamic it is moving quickly by the time the regulators figure out what you know one one thing is going on something new has happened. I mean, we can look back already at, you know, the, the initial coin offerings a few years ago. Now, all of a sudden, we've moved to DeFi. Um, you know, this, the, no one knows what's coming next. Uh, you know, all of a sudden, something pops up and it all of a sudden takes over at a, at a very rapid pace. And um, that's why a sandbox is really probably one of the better approaches in order to keep up at this point. And I think just to have a regulator that's interested in having that dialogue and conversations to understand, yes, things are changing. Um, and we don't want to be left behind. Interesting, interesting. One important thing. Well, in Venezuela and Latin America in general, we mostly speak Spanish. Um, people, people may think, well, what if I need some paperwork in Spanish? And that's one reason of international planning, a lot of people is probably choosing Panama, for instance, instead of Barbados. Not everyone can speak like you and me who are doing this. And have you ever, in, your, in the firm, have ever thought about having uh, services rendered in Spanish? And another thing, what if I have my company registered in Barbados and I, I want to make some uh, paperwork in Spanish. It will be possible to do it directly or do I have to sign up with a, with a legal uh, translator or bring it here? Have, do you know any experience about Spanish speaking uh, clients that they need right. their paperwork in Spanish? Yes, so the official documents that would need to be filed with the registry and any regulatory bodies are gonna need to be in English. But what, I, what we do for clients, you know, if they have agreements and certain documentation in Spanish originally and they need to file it, 
we then get that translated to English to be filed. So really the, the I mean, I suppose besides the incorporation documents, which must be put in English, the other documents can really originate in Spanish and we will then file the translations. And then furthermore, I suppose, in additional documents that don't need to be filed with the regulatory body. You know, if you have an agreement with somebody, you know, various contracts, I mean, you can operate fully in Spanish in that regard. It is just the official documents that need to be filed that would need to be translated from Spanish to English so that the Barbados Registry has what they want in English. Uh, but, you know, you, you raise a good point, obviously, Panama being, you know, native Spanish speaking and us not being it. Um, creates a bit of a hurdle and a barrier in that way. Um, yes, it can be overcome. And, you know, it depends on if Barbados maybe fits for the business model in particular with something that Panama doesn't, that's where we'll get interest. And in other areas, Panama may just be a better fit, you know? Um, one country I don't think can be everything to everyone. And, you know, it's like everything in life, it is what is the appropriate fit for what are you doing? And any international tax planning, you know, you'll look at it. Some people will use Barbados for certain things and for other things they'll use Panama. You know, it really just depends on, on, on what they want to accomplish and what they're trying to do. I was mentioning that because once I had the chance of working with, the, with this team, that there were people that speak only English, others only Spanish. Some of us talk the two languages and all the drafts were made in, in, in both, in both uh, languages. And of course, the one to be registered was in English. And uh, at the end it says, oh, it, this is going to be draft in two languages, but for the purposes of registry, uh, we're going to considering the, the, the English. But at the same time, it was good because the paper was signed in the, those two languages, but in, for the purposes of registering was in, 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 in English. I don't know if finally they got registered in both, uh, well, in that, that, in that way, but it was interesting. It was interesting that you have the both uh, languages there. Yeah, and I, I think it would be a similar approach in Barbados. Interesting. So interesting. If people can still operate in Spanish for the things that they need to and for agreements that don't need to be registered, sure. You know, need, no need to translate everything, but just those important documents. Well, one last thing that I would like to talk to you about is we're going to be witnesses of the newborn of our new republic. Barbados, yes. Barbados is going to be a new republic in the American continent. Tell us a, lot, a little bit about those, that, that's an interesting fact. I mean, you were parliament, then independent, and right now you're going to become a republic. You, have, uh, you had a referendum. Tell us a little bit, because it's interesting to know about that. Right. So, I mean, we, we've always been a historically a British colony. You know, we were ruled by the British. Um, we then gained our independence from them in 1966, similar to a lot of former colonies. And right now we have the same system as, you know, larger well-known countries like Canada and Australia, where we have um, in our own parliament, we, we elect our prime minister, but the queen is technically still head of state. Um, I suppose it's more of a symbolic role than any active management in the country because the prime minister and parliament are already the ones running the country. Um, however, the prime minister made a decision for us to be a republic. We actually didn't have a referendum. There, there was a discussion about having a referendum. And I think um, she just went ahead and, and made the announcement that we are going to become a republic and move on without the referendum. You know, sure, a referendum for something like this is probably nice um, just because of what it is. But at the same time, you know, um, the world has changed from the old colonial powers ruling the world, having the queen in England as a head of state. Um, you know, we have, we have deep ties to the English. Um, there's no animosity. However, I think the world has just changed and, you know, we're our own country. So there's, you know, why not go forward with uh, being a republic and, you know, every, everything being run by Barbadians as it b basically is anyway. So, yeah, I mean, it was quite a bold step and it was, the decision was taken quickly without a lot of fuss. And uh, we'll, we'll continue on and it will be exciting to see what comes of it. 
interesting. It's really interesting for studying you know, politics in general and the world, as you mentioned, it is totally different. The idea of monarchy and parliament and republic is it can't be seen. They can't be seen like previous years or centuries. It's an interesting fact that you're going through. And yeah, and it was it was a bit interesting that she just announced it and didn't make it into a big political debate because normally these things that have a I mean, well, we would have seen um, Brexit in the UK with them leaving Europe, the EU, and the amount of political fuss that has gone on for you know five or six years and and the way it probably does affect the country and, and something like that goes to a referendum. This didn't, and I suppose there are trade-offs in, in which way you look at it, you know. It's always nice to let people have a voice, but at the same time, you know, it was it's amazing how it was done with so little fuss because we're so used to seeing all the, you know, all the politics that comes with, with stuff like this and, and, you know, everybody trying to one-up the other and, and maybe animosity that comes for it. So, you know, I suppose just getting it done quickly and, you know, I don't think there's any real opposition to it. Um, so it was interesting, to say the least. It is, it is. And well, as I mentioned it, it, it is, we're, we're, we're witnesses of this. We have yes. the internet, we have news. I mean, differently that previous times we can, you know, check of what's going on. Uh, Barbados, even though it's an island in the Caribbean, well, technically it's not the Caribbean. Caribbean begins exactly in Barbados. And yes. you're really well connected. I mean, you have flights from all over practically. It is to Canada, New York, uh, direct to, to Europe. I mean, even yeah. though being in the Caribbean, you are connected everywhere. So we can follow up what's going on. Well, once the COVID will we'll get through, but it's interesting. Yes, yes. I mean, we have direct flights daily from Miami, Toronto, and London, as well as uh, New York in normal times. Obviously, with COVID, there's been some disruption, but hopefully life will return to normal. I think we all want it to. I'll hope visiting soon. Yes, yes. We'd love to have you here. I have to be there. Justin, to conclude this great conversation, how can we contact you? Can you give us the, the, the address of the page where we can contact you or any email? Also send it to me and I can put it down here somewhere. Sure, sure. I mean, my email is jcole, so j-c-o-l-e at dgmgroup.com. And likewise, our website is dgmfinancialgroup.com. The other place you can go if you're interested in investing in Barbados is the government's website for it, which is investbarbados.org. And they have a great team over there that, um, you know, for various projects, you can reach out to them and they're happy to assist also. Perfect. Yeah, well, yes, we met at this uh, booth. All of you Correct. had in, the, in Miami. It is great. Yes, yes. Well, Justin, really nice to talk to you. Like the first time we met, uh, we hope we'll see you soon in Barbados. Yes, Roberto, we'd love to have you here. Perfect. Bye. Great. Bye. Thank you so much.